September 2028. That's the date SpaceX is now targeting to put humans back on the moon. Not 2027, not 2026, and definitely not the wildly optimistic 2024 timeline NASA once announced. A leaked internal SpaceX document just changed everything we thought we knew about the Artemis moon landing schedule. And here's what makes this particularly interesting. For the first time, we're seeing dates that actually align with reality, not political promises or marketing hype. The document reveals three critical milestones. June 2026. Two starships attempt the first-ever propellant transfer in space, moving up to 1,500 tons of fuel between spacecraft June 2027. An uncrewed starship attempts to land on the lunar surface, and September 2028, astronauts finally touch down. Now, before you think this is just another delay, consider this NASA's own Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel visited SpaceX's Starbase facility in Texas. These aren't armchair critics. We're talking about a former NASA flight director, two former astronauts, people who've actually flown in space. They walked through the facilities, met with SpaceX's top engineers, and came away impressed by the manufacturing speed and innovation. But they also said something crucial. The original 2027 timeline was significantly challenged and could be years late. So SpaceX isn't falling behind. They're finally being honest about what it actually takes to land a 15-story building on another world. But here's what nobody's talking about. Why does moving 1,500 tons of cryogenic fuel between two spacecraft in orbit matter so much that it could make or break the entire mission? The answer comes down to one fundamental problem that's plagued space exploration since the beginning. Fuel. Starship is the most powerful rocket ever built. It can lift over 100 tons to low Earth orbit. But here's the catch. After reaching orbit, it has just enough propellant left to return home and land, going to the moon. Mars? That requires a completely full tank, and there's no gas station at 200 miles altitude. This is where SpaceX's plan gets genuinely unprecedented. They're not just building one starship, they're building an entire orbital refueling infrastructure. The current blueprint calls for 10 to 20 tanker starships to launch, one after another, each carrying fuel to dock with the lunar lander in orbit 20 dockings. 20 fuel transfers, 20 opportunities for something to go catastrophically wrong. Every time two spacecraft dock, there's risk. Alignment errors, valve failures. And we're not talking about pumping regular fuel here. Starship runs on liquid methane and liquid oxygen, chilled to negative 160 degrees Celsius. These cryogenic propellants boil off constantly in the vacuum of space. Nobody has ever transferred them in microgravity before. Nobody knows exactly how much will evaporate during each transfer. Nobody has done this, period. Paul Hill, the former NASA flight director who visited Starbase, put it bluntly. On-orbit cryogenic propellant transfer is critical to the HLS mission and absolutely must succeed for Artemis III. But there are several threats to achieving that. Threats like developing Starship Version 3, which needs to fly reliably. Threats like building tanker and depot configurations that require major upgrades. Threats like ensuring the new Raptor 3 engines perform flawlessly. Any one of these could derail the entire mission timeline. That's why SpaceX is now proposing something smarter. A propellant depot. Think of it as an orbital fuel tank that stays in space permanently. Here's how it works. Launch the depot first, then send those 10 to 15 tanker starships to fill it up over several weeks. If a tanker has docking issues, no problem. Send another one. The depot just waits in orbit, accumulating fuel. 
Then, when everything's ready, the lunar lander launches and docks just once with the depot for a single clean refueling operation, one docking instead of twenty, one critical transfer instead of a dozen potential failure points. This isn't SpaceX being overly cautious. NASA has already stated that propellant depots are the long-term path to sustainable deep space missions. It's the only way this system scales beyond one-off missions. But building and testing this infrastructure takes time. Real time. Not PowerPoint time. SpaceX has already assembled the first flight-ready Starship HLS at their facilities. This isn't a mock-up or a test article. It's equipped with avionics, power systems, life support, communications hardware, and thermal regulation equipment. Engineers are running full-scale demonstrations right now. They've put real people inside a mock cabin to test atmosphere control, sanitation systems, humidity management, and temperature regulation while measuring noise levels during operations. They've qualified the docking adapter that will connect Starship to NASA's Orion capsule in lunar orbit, using technology proven on SpaceX's Dragon 2 spacecraft. They've dropped full-scale landing legs onto simulated lunar soil to understand impact absorption and how the legs interact with moon dust. They've fired Raptor engines through a throttle profile specifically designed for lunar touchdown, where the ground doesn't provide the same resistance as Earth. Other tests have pushed hardware to Extreme's engineers, blasted shielding materials, insulation, and windows with micrometeoroid-sized projectiles at hypervelocity. They exposed components to temperature swings from negative 150 to positive 120 degrees Celsius, they chilled Raptor engines before firing them to simulate cold starts after weeks in the vacuum of space. According to SpaceX, the HLS team has completed 49 major contract milestones, covering everything from subsystem design to ground infrastructure and mission operations. Here's what's remarkable about that number. SpaceX only gets paid when each milestone is successfully met and most have been finished on or ahead of schedule. In aerospace, that almost never happens. The company has even partnered with Axiom Space to test a flight representative elevator and airlock system using actual EVA spacesuits. Astronauts need to move between Starship's pressurized cabin 30 meters above the lunar surface and the ground below, that's a 10-story descent on a vehicle with no atmosphere to slow your fall if something fails. They've rehearsed this over and over to make sure it works. Medical systems and telemedicine links have been demonstrated. Navigation sensors, radar, and landing software have undergone extensive testing to ensure Starship can identify and precisely target a landing site mission planners from SpaceX and NASA have conducted comprehensive reviews of crew procedures, flight rules, and the entire mission flow. This level of detail, this amount of hardware testing, is why the 2028 timeline actually feels achievable. SpaceX isn't just talking about flying to the moon. They're methodically solving every single technical challenge required to land humans there and bring them home safely. But here's where things get complicated. China isn't waiting around. Their lunar program is advancing rapidly. They're planning to land Taikonauts on the moon around 2030, maybe earlier. If that happens before the U.S. returns, it would mark a symbolic shift in space leadership not seen since the Soviet Union put Yuri Gagarin in orbit before Alan Shepard. The difference is scale. China's lander will be comparable to the Apollo lunar module. Small, functional, designed for short-duration missions with two or three crew members. The U.S., meanwhile, is preparing to land a vehicle the size of a 15-story building that can carry significantly more crew, more cargo, and support longer surface operations. Apollo was a sprint. Artemis is the foundation for permanent presence. But that ambition requires infrastructure that doesn't exist yet. 
It requires technology that's never been tested in real mission conditions. And it requires accepting that realistic timelines don't fit neatly into political cycles or press conferences. The leaked SpaceX document that surfaced recently shows the company plans to deliver an updated integrated master schedule to NASA in December. After that, SpaceX and NASA will revise the current contract to reflect the new timeline. Until then, as the document explicitly states, these dates are goals, not approved contract milestones. Translation Things could still change. Yet even with that caveat, the September 2028 target represents something Space Watchers have been waiting for. Honesty. The original 2024 date was fantasy. The 2027 target was political theater. A 2028 timeline with propellant transfer demos in 2026 and an uncrewed landing in 2027 actually matches the engineering reality of what SpaceX is building and what they're building is staggering in scope. This isn't just a moon rocket. It's a transportation system designed to make cislunar space accessible on a routine basis. The same starship that lands astronauts on the moon will eventually carry cargo to Mars, deploy satellites, and potentially serve as orbital infrastructure itself. That vision is why NASA took the risk of selecting Starship over more conventional designs. It's a bet on transformational capability rather than incremental improvement. But transformation takes time. So when will humans actually walk on the moon again? The reality is this, when American and Chinese astronauts stand on the lunar surface in the late 2020s, they won't be alone for long. Both nations are racing to establish permanent bases at the South Pole, where water ice could sustain life and fuel rockets for deeper space missions. But here's the problem. There are only so many ideal landing sites, only so many ice-rich craters, and only so much flat terrain to build on the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, says no nation can claim the moon, but it never addressed how to share its resources. The Artemis Accords, signed by 56 countries, including some working with China, try to create transparency and safety zones. Yet critics fear these zones might become territorial claims in disguise. There's also the 1979 Moon Agreement, which actually promotes cooperation and shared benefits. But the US, China and Russia never signed it. What matters now is the choice we make. Space doesn't have to amplify rivalry. It can become the platform where nations collaborate on science, resource management, and humanity's next giant leap. When boots hit lunar soil again, those astronauts represent all of us, not competing empires. SpaceX is building the vehicle. NASA and its partners are setting the stage. But the outcome, whether we colonize the moon together or alone, depends on the decisions made right here on Earth. If you're following this journey with us, hit that subscribe button and join the Atlas Space community. Drop a comment with your prediction, cooperation or competition, and share this video with anyone who still believes space exploration can unite us. The moon is waiting. Let's make sure we get there the right way.